Here's an idea. The greatest argument against transhumanism might be Futurama. After a certain point, nobody likes getting older. You get tired, you start to lose your hair, you get forgetful, and the chances you will have no idea how to use the printer increase dramatically. Not the least of the folks fed up with the aging process are the transhumanists, a group of scientists, philosophers, and theorists who are working towards a point where technology will free us from all biological constraints. That's right, all. Say what? Coined by French philosopher Pierre Teilhard de Chardin in his 1949 book The Future of Mankind and forwarded by some notoriously smart folks like Ray Kurzweil, Nick Bostrom, and Max Moore, the goals of transhumanists are not insignificant. Use technology to stop aging, erase all mental and physical disabilities, and reach true social and political equality. On the human by human level, maybe that looks something like the Bionic Commando or Samus Aran or the Six Million Dollar Man or Data or like something we've never imagined before. The ultimate goal being to help us reach our next evolutionary stage, like a cloud of gas or a face in a jar. Technology, the transhumanists say, will help us reach this point, a point where we are so fundamentally different that 100% of humanity's involuntary suffering will be eliminated. This belief is called abolitionism, and it's the exact opposite of the Kurt Vonnegut short story Harrison Bergeron basically. Sounds pretty pie in the sky, right? I mean, in David Pierce's abolitionist manifesto called The Hedonistic Imperative, he even says things like, over the next thousand years or so, the biological substrates of suffering will be eradicated completely. Malaise will be replaced by the biochemistry of bliss. This is a prediction which, though it occurs around the same time as, is essentially the opposite of Futurama. Well, sort of the opposite. I mean, Futurama's portrayal of the year 3000 does have all kinds of crazy, life-altering technological advancements. Space travel, sentient robots, transportation tubes, dark matter engines, Farnsworth's alternate universe box. Not to mention a united world government, united under Robot Nixon, but still, interstellar diplomacy, plenty of biological advancements, and near immortality. As long as you don't mind being a head in a jar, I guess. But regardless of the fact that you can get all roboted up or smell distant and odors, Futurama's world seems pretty far away from Pierce's pre-programmed euphoria. Seriously though, New New York has cloning, near-infinite sources of clean energy, infinite and renewable sources of food, and one globally united nation. Yet social issues abound, as do political and economic complexities, personal struggles, and in general, unless you've been brain slugged, everything's great. Everyone should get a brain slug. There's plenty of stuff to be upset about. Futurama's brand of transhumanity looks pretty different from the kind they advertise on the side of the box. Though able to defeat aging and remedy suffering, it is far from an Eden. Futurama isn't the post-scarcity, post-war Earth of Star Trek. It's not even Thomas More's complex but fair utopia or Matt Faction's Cold Heart Island. It's just sort of like today, but later. You could say that Futurama embraces a human characteristic that the transhumanists think they can erase or reverse. It's something called the hedonic treadmill. The hedonic treadmill explains the fact that whatever positive or negative impacts occur, people's happiness levels will always equalize. Like, think about all of the positive impacts technology has had on everyday life. Many diseases have been eradicated, tons of simple tasks are a thousand times easier. You have a whole universe of information right at your fingertips. But are we on the whole any happier than we were in 1950? I mean, for all of the awesome and positive stuff that happened, why aren't we all just constantly enthralled? Though life might be easier, we are not necessarily happier. I made myself sad. Like, let's say someone stole your bike, and you want to punch the universe. But after not long, your fundamental happiness level is about the same it always is. That is the hedonic treadmill hard at work. It's sort of like a mood thermostat, making sure that you're always at a cool, comfortable, yeah, Pretty okay, I guess. It explains how Fry can be frozen for a thousand years and basically be fine within a day or two. Yahoo! And how, as Louis C.K. might put it, everything is amazing and nobody is happy. You're sitting in a chair in the sky. Yes. In order for everything to be amazing and for everyone to be happy all of the time, which you could argue is the transhumagol numero transhum uno, the hedonic treadmill would have to be disabled or stabilized or something, which maybe that would be amazing, but which through a kind of weird enforced emotional socialism might just turn us into the neutral planet. I have no strong feelings one way or the other. Like in the imagined future societies of Krypton, the Jetsons, and Futurama, everything is amazing, but amazing is also sometimes inconvenient, or bad, or fraught, or polarizing, or just 
normal. Those complications, yes, are the sources of pain, suffering, malaise, and boredom, but are also from where we derive goals, satisfaction, and ambition. The ups and downs and peaks and plateaus of the hedonic treadmill are part of human nature. They are sources of inspiration and go for itness. You're right though. This is all a little future apples and space oranges. An academically supported, expertly backed theory about human evolution compared to a science fiction television show with a frog that can hypnotize you. But in a way, both present a possible future. Both have their points, and both in some way resemble today. We already sort of are transhuman. I mean, we have pacemakers, cochlear implants, and pneumatic limbs, so we're not saying that's not gonna happen. But are happiness levels increasing with inverse proportionality to the number of transistors you can fit in a square inch? Seems like no. Surrounded by all of this life-changing and extending technology, we still fight with our friends, get mad at our bosses, suffer from inferiority complexes, and try, though not always, succeed at being better versions of ourselves. And my gut tells me, maybe that's okay. What do you guys think? Which future is more likely? One that resembles Futurama or one that looks like transhumanism? Let us know in the comments. And good news, everyone! Here's a subscribe button. Everybody's comments sound better when pressed onto vinyl. Let's see what you guys had to say about recordings versus live performances. Aki Yameko makes a really interesting point about musicians using computers to make music, uh, which is especially timely given the My Bloody Valentine release that just happened, where they make a big deal of the fact that their record is pressed from an all-analog process, unlike most records, which are pressed from digital files, making it kind of pointless that they're pressed on their records. It's which is interesting. David Banks makes a case for the authority of the live performance uh, because of the collective effervescence of the audience and the total immersion experience, uh, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, that's not something that you get in your living room. Tyler Wolfgang points out the disappointment we've all felt while listening to a live CD, which is basically just the worst of every world. T3 Sayagai makes a really, really great distinction between recording artists and musicians who record their music. Uh, so we will just pause here so that you can read his awesome comment. To Peglafon, I was actually thinking about this yesterday. I was reading um, this music critic, Whitney Ballier, who was saying that jazz is the sound of surprise, which I think is true, but let's say you're going to go see a, a performer who's a famous improviser. Even if they're playing something new, your experience is still mediated by all of those recordings that you've heard, which is, it's just hard to get away from. So, I don't know. Jeff Davis makes a case for the authority of the live performance because you can actually go and see that these people you've only heard recordings of are real, actual people with, like, selves. Which is mostly true. Pitbull, though, I'm not sure about him, uh, but for the most part, maybe, yeah, true. So I went to go see Savoir Ador and Ra Ra Riot. Savoir Ador was clearly playing music for an audience for a live setting, while Ra Ra Riot was clearly trying to reconstruct some sort of recorded artifact or something. And the experience was so weird and bizarre that, I don't know, I might actually rewrite some of the episode based upon my experience. Mr. Monfrey's class points out that there's some technological determinism in the equipment that you use to experience your music, which can uh, give you a better or worse experience, but also that going to a live show is about connecting with fandoms, which is a thing that we didn't even touch on. Two quick notes also about live events coming up. Um, I'm gonna be recording for the NPR radio show Ask Me Another uh, here in Brooklyn um, on February 18th at the Bell House. So if you're over 21, you can buy a ticket. I'll put a link in the description. And I will also be at Playlist Live in Orlando in March. So if you're gonna be there, come say hi.